Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here again, and I'm going to be going over the basics of regulation of gene expression. Now this is a super complicated topic, and I'm only going to hit upon a couple of key ideas in it, uh, but hopefully it'll be a good overview and one that will allow you to apply these concepts on some challenge problems coming up. So uh, first, let's talk about the types of interactions that regulate gene expression. So this will differ a little bit, whether we're talking about a cell that has a nucleus or one that doesn't have a nucleus. For this particular case, I'm going to talk all about cells that have a nucleus and some of the key components, and, and there's some overlap between those with and without a nucleus. But as a broad category, I'm going to break these into three big groupings. These are things that are regulations that can occur before you have the transcription or pre-transcriptional regulation. These would be things like methylation or acetylation of histones, or as we sometimes call histone modification. And then there's also regulations that can happen during transcription. So these could be interactions of transcription factors, activators, enhancers, promoters, things that actually have an influence on uh, how rapidly, how often, or even whether or not transcription occurs in general. And then we have a series of post-transcriptional regulations, and these would be things, again, in eukaryotes, the idea of RNA processing using some RNA splicing, uh, the removing of introns and the putting together of exons and which specific exons are putting together, uh, mRNA degradation. So how long does the mRNA stick around? Does it get uh, translated just once? Does it get translated multiple times? And then we can also in this post-transcriptional idea of what we do with the proteins is going to be processed. Is it something that's going to undergo degradation through ubiquitin tagging, or is it something that is going to stick around the cell for a very long time? So all of these could be various things that would impact how genes are expressed and how impactful they will be on the life of the cell, or in the case of some organisms, the life of that organism. So let's talk specifically about the regulatory sequences and how those respond on when it comes to DNA. And so we generally say that regulatory sequences are stretches of DNA that interact with regulatory proteins to control transcription. So we know that there is a particular region on a DNA strand that is going to be a gene. And that gene is going to have the open reading frame or the sequence of DNA that the mRNA will be turned into. And then mRNA, after it's been transcribed, will, will be going out and being translated into a series of amino acids. But before we go to that gene, we're going to have a region that is referred to as a promoter. This is going to be where the RNA polymerase is going to bind and is going to initiate the process of transcription. But the question is, how does the RNA polymerase know where to bind? So in that instance, there's going to be a lot of other factors that are going to influence where it is that the RNA polymerase is going to be binding. And for that, we are going to have things that include enhancers. These are going to be control elements that are going to be, again, upstream even of the promoter that are going to be flags for where we're going to want the RNA polymerase to come in. Now, interacting between where the promoter is and where the enhancer is, we are going to have transcription factors and activators and other mediator proteins that are going to come in that are going to facilitate where the RNA is going to bind. So just because you have a gene on the DNA of a cell does not mean that that cell is going to express that protein. And in fact, you can generally think about it that most of the genes in most cells are not going to undergo transcription and translation most of the time. In fact, in every single one of your cells, you have the DNA that will be able to make all of the proteins that your body can make. But just because you have that DNA does not mean that every single cell is going to make it. Certainly there will be some housekeeping genes that are going to be found in nearly every cell, but a lot of the genes are very tissue specific and will only be made in specific locations. And it is the complex series of signals, the activators and the transcription factors and the mediator proteins that need to be present in a given cell at the right time in order to turn genes on. So gene regulation allows cells to make 
the right proteins in the right tissues at the right time. And that's going to lead to cells behaving appropriately for their specific tissue type. Now, another factor that can play a role in the turning on or off of genes, as I mentioned before, is some of the pre-transcriptional regulations. And we often refer to these as epigenetic changes. So epigenetic changes affect gene expression through reversible modification of DNA or histones. So what we have here is you can see the DNA is wrapped around these histones. And in some instances, the DNA is wrapped really, really tightly. So down here on the bottom where we see the gene is switched off, we can see that the DNA has been silenced. The chromatin has been condensed. And what we see is that we have methylated uh, the cytosines, uh, those are the red circles, and we've deacetylated the histones. And so we've modified both the DNA and the histones in order to create a tight coil of DNA, making it so that transcription is not possible. The DNA is just not available. But in a different tissue, we will see that the gene is switched on. And by that, what we've done is we've opened up the chromatin, we've unmethylated the cytosines, and we've acetylated the histones. And what this has done is it's created a situation where now the DNA is open and you can see that transcription factors and coactivators can come in and we can undergo transcription of specific areas here. So what do we talk about epigenetics? So this is a regulation epigenetic that sits on top of the genome. This is not a regulation that says that this individual over here has a particular gene and therefore they make a protein. This person has a gene, but depending on the state of the DNA and the histones, that gene may or may not be able to be transcribed. And so this is a form of pre-transcriptional regulation that will dictate certain cells' ability or inability to produce certain types of proteins. And again, you don't want every cell to make every protein at all times. So this is going to be a very useful process to regulate which cells are making which proteins at certain times. Now, the phenotype of a cell or an organism is determined by the combination of the genes that are expressed and the levels at which they are ultimately expressed. And so, as I mentioned before, we want every cell tissue to make the right proteins in the right time frame for that cell. And so we can see that there's observable what we refer to as cell differentiation resulting from the expression of genes in tissue-specific proteins. And so what we can see here on the top is that we undergo the fusion of sperm and egg. We form that initial cell that is what we refer to as totipotent, meaning that cell can form any cell in the individual or it can form the placenta. That cell continues to divide, forming the blastocyst. And then within that blastocyst, we have what are known as pluripotent cells. These are cells that have the capacity to turn into any tissue type in that organism's body. It's that inner mass of cell that will ultimately develop into the human fetus. Now, as those cells continue to divide, the induction of certain transcription factors during this development is going to help and help determine which cell types those, uh, those will ultimately turn into. And so what we will find is that initially the cell regulation is very, very broad, that we're going to divide them into three broad tissue layers. We're going to have the endoderm, that inner, inner tissue layer, the mesoderm, which is a middle tissue layer, and an ectoderm, which is an outer tissue layer. And those are going to be very broad classifications of cells. And then furthermore, we're going to determine the specific tissue types that they'll ultimately become. And when it gets down to becoming part of the circulatory system or say the nervous system or the immune system, we are only going to be turning on specific genes in order to lead to those destinies. And then other genes will be turned on in order to have those cells function in their ultimate cell destiny. So it is really important to know that during this whole process from fertilization to the determination and differentiation of the different cell tissues, there's going to be a series of genes that are turned on or turned off. And the ultimate expression of those cells is going to be due to varying gene expression throughout this process.
So let's talk about regulatory sequences as they apply to DNA. And this will be a little bit of what we've talked about before. So as a general rule, you will have these re regulatory sequences that are upstream. They include those enhancers, um, the promoters. We have these areas before we get to the open reading frame. We'll then have an open reading frame. And then we'll have regulatory sequences at the end, which will lead to the terminators. So what we will see in this case is that we start with the DNA with all of these other regulatory sequences around it. We will produce mRNA. And that mRNA will be a series of exons or sequences that will be expressed. And there will be introns, which will be intervening or interrupting sequences that are there. Then we will undergo a post-transcriptional modification of that mRNA and turn it ultimately into the protein coding mRNA that we have, along with some regulatory sequences, that 5' prime cap and the poly-A tail that are at the beginning or the end of that sequence that will help determine sort of the zip code of where this particular protein will go. Where is it going to be destined and what type of protein uh, location is this ultimately going to be destined to? This is going to then lead to this protein coding region, seeking out uh, ribosomes in the cytoplasm, and then ultimately turning into a protein that will function somewhere. So I want to take a step away from our eukaryotes, which is pretty much what we've been talking to this point, and hit upon our prokaryotes. So prokaryotes also have regulatory uh, sequences in them. These regulatory sequences are much simpler, and uh, there's generally two types that we often talk about. We talk about usually um, inducible systems, which is the example I'm going to give you here, and a repressible system, which I'll talk about briefly in the end. So in prokaryotes, you are going to have a single cell with a very small genome, and that genome is going to carry all the genes and there's going to be a lot less regulatory sequences in there. Much more of the DNA that is found in a prokaryote is going to be dedicated to producing proteins. There's a lot fewer uh, replications. There's a lot few, there's no introns that are in there that are going to intervene in sequences. And so there still needs to be a little bit of gene plasticity, the ability to turn genes on and off depending on the environment. Because if a gene is expressed, but that protein uh, doesn't help in survivability, there's an energy cost associated with producing that protein that will put a burden on the living organism. So being able to only produce proteins at appropriate times is still a very evolutionary advantageous thing for prokaryotes to do. So let's look at the lac operon as an example. So under normal circumstances, the lac operon is a series of steps where a repressor is going to block the transcription and translation of enzymes that break down lactose. So the default state of this sequence is that you are going to repress the making of enzymes that break down lactose. So this is generally viewed as the idea that we're only going to make enzymes that break down lactose if lactose is present. Now it turns out that that repressor if lactose is present, the lactose has the ability to bind specifically to that repressor and remove it. So it actually changes its shape, just like we think of a inhibitor changing the shape of a protein in the case of an enzyme, or just like we think of a non-competitive inhibitor of an enzyme altering or changing that shape by binding into a different location. It's going to alter the place where the repressor binds to the DNA. And if lactose is present, the repressor will be removed from the DNA. And then this number one here, which is going to be our RNA polymerase, is going to bind and it's going to lead to the transcription of our genes of interest, which in this case are going to be the enzymes associated with breaking down lactose. And so this is called an inducible system because when the conditions are right in the environment, we will induce the proteins to being made. Now, we contrast that with a repressible system, in which case you will default make the genes all of the time, and that only when there's a certain condition present would you block and repress the making of those proteins. We usually view that as a trip operon, and trip operon is the manufacturing of the key amino acid tryptophan. Now, if tryptophan is present in the environment, tryptophan will bind to a repressor and block the synthesis of tryptophan. If tryptophan is present, the, there is uh, very little advantage to manufacturing tryptophan. It's a waste of energy. But 
If there's no tryptophan present, tryptophan is an essential amino acid necessary for the survivability of an E. coli, so it's going to make it. So this is a good example of turning genes on or off depending on environmental conditions and allowing the organism to survive under the best energetic and environmental conditions. So another thing to think about is that in eukaryotes, as we said, it's a much more complicated system. The genes are going to be much more highly regulated. They're going to be much more highly organized. So we've already talked about the concept of having the DNA wrapped around histones, those histones then allowing us to have some regulation of whether a gene is turned on or off. We also know that there are uh, certain other systems that take place. So we know that in eukaryotes, some groups of genes may be influenced by the same transcription factors in order to coordinate this gene expression. So what we know is that if you have a particular tissue type that is going to receive a signal, so let's say there is a signal that is going to turn on a series of metabolic events, you may see that the same specific transcription factors may have a w ability to influence both the opening up of genes, or it may have the ability to target and open up uh, and lead to the transcription of certain particular factors. Now, a lot of these factors that are sent out throughout the bloodstream are going to only turn on the genes in very specific cells. So for example, we have estrogen shown here on the right, only in a tissue where you have both estrogen present and estrogen receptors are you ultimately going to get this gene expression. So by coupling together different signals that are going to be found in some cells but not others, you are going to be able to dictate which tissues respond to signals and which tissues don't so that, again, only the right tissues are going to be making the right proteins at the right time. All right. So I know that was complicated. I know there's a lot of information here uh, about this. We will be looking at several examples in class about different examples of gene regulation, hopefully break those down. But hopefully this was helpful and I'll talk to everybody soon.